I'm Indy Nidell, and this is another exciting edition of Out of the Foxholes, where I sit here in my chair of infinite knowledge and answer your questions about the Second World War. Let's see, Justin Wilson asks, were there any discrimination towards people from Axis countries in neutral America other than Japan? In 1940, uh, the U.S. holds its nationwide census, which finds approximately 1.2 million German nationals living in the country, as well as 11 million Americans of German descent. Now, the census itself isn't anything that special. The U.S. has one every decade. But also that year, President Franklin Roosevelt signs the Smith Act. This stipulates that all aliens over the age of 14 must register with the federal government, carry registration cards, and be fingerprinted. That same act also sets criminal penalties for anyone advocating the overthrow of the U.S. government by force or violence. So at a time when America is increasingly leaning towards the Allies, it looks like its government is making sure there are no German or Italian fifth columnists hiding away somewhere. In fact, already in 1939, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover created the Custodial Detention Index to identify and categorize potentially subversive elements. By mid-1941, that index includes tens of thousands of Italians, Germans, fascists, and communists, some marked for immediate arrest upon an outbreak of war. There is no congressional or judicial oversight here. And it is pretty easy to get yourself put on the list. All whom Hoover deems communist or fascist go on the list. Any group or organization with some focus on German or Italian heritage goes on the list. Uh, some influential Italian Americans, some influential German Americans are thrown into the mix as well just to be on the safe side. Now, is it a good idea for Roosevelt and Hoover to keep a watchful eye on Germans or Italians in America? There is support for European dictatorships, like um, the openly pro-Nazi German-American Bund has 25,000 paying members, and there are similar pro-fascist organizations raising support for Benito Mussolini. But the huge majority of German Americans wants nothing to do with the Nazis or with their politics. Over 100,000 of them had fled to the States in the 1930s, including Albert Einstein, Thomas Mann, and Henry Kissinger. On top of federal mistrust, though, German Americans can face harsh treatment from the general population, with private companies sometimes refusing to hire people with German or Italian ancestry. Roosevelt thinks this is pretty stupid, however. In June 1941, he signs Executive Order 8802, which bans discrimination in the employment of workers in defense industries or government because of race, creed, color, or national origin. It is the first federal action to prohibit workplace discrimination and promote equal opportunity. Okay, let's see. Uh, Frederick Silvestre asks, were there any countries in South Africa that were pro-German or pro-Axis? If you mean South Africa as in the Union of South Africa, then this is just one country. It's a self-governing dominion of the British Empire. And it declares war on Germany on September 6, 1939. But though it is one country, the communities within it are notoriously split and divided. It is under white minority rule, meaning that the huge black majority is ruled over with next to no rights. But even within the white minority, people are at odds with each other. Okay, little backstory. Dutch-speaking settlers have lived in southern Africa since the 17th century, mainly in a Dutch colony around the Cape of Good Hope. But in the 19th century, most of them move into the interior of southern Africa to escape the British, who took over the area. Over time, these settlers have developed a national identity as Afrikaners or Boers, and during their migration established several Boer republics, displacing large numbers of black Africans in the process. But if you know anything about history, you'll know that escaping the British is never really a long-term option. Towards the end of the 19th century, the British looked to start annexing the Boer republics, resulting in a series of clashes, most notably the Second Boer War from 1899 to 1902. The German Empire supports the Boers during this war, but the British Empire win and annex the Boer republics. Eight years later, the Union of South Africa is formed, which includes the territory annexed after the Boer Wars. In the 1930s, white South African politics is roughly divided between anti-British Afrikaners and pro-British South Africans. 
When war breaks out in 1939, Prime Minister Barry Herzog is very much pro-neutrality. The pro-British Jan Smuts leads the opposition against Herzog and his neutrality, and he narrowly wins a motion on the war, ousts Herzog for the position of Prime Minister, and declares war on Germany. Smuts still treads carefully, avoiding imposing war measures like conscription in case of a backlash or even an uprising. Even so, there is a lot of opposition. The pro-German Oseva Brandwag was launched several months before the war broke out in the interests of preserving Afrikaner culture and opposing conflict with Germany. It is debatable how committed they are to fascism on an ideological level, but they are undoubtedly sympathetic to Nazi Germany. It counts almost 400,000 members at its peak in 1941, and some of its members form paramilitary groups that hold demonstrations and carry out sabotage. Smuts interns about 2,000 members, including future Prime Minister John Vorster, but still the acts continue. But that's only the active resistance. Barry Herzog still keeps up his anti-war sentiment, forming the Herenig de Nationale Party to champion its cause. Not all members are necessarily or actively pro-German, but some are. There is a group inside the party called the New Order, formed by Oswald Piro, former Minister of Justice and Minister of Defense. It openly embraces Nazi ideology. And in case you were wondering about the black majority in South Africa, most of them care little for the war, seeing it as a white man's war. White South Africans agree barring blacks from military service and only allowing a few to serve in very minor supporting roles. So in short, yes, there are South African factions here in 1941 that are very much pro-German and pro-Axis. Uh, Pawikorn Butrawong, I know I'm mangling that name and I'm sorry, but uh, it's a cool name. Uh, let's see, asks, what did Germany do to the Maginot Line after France fell? As you will know, if you've been watching this series, the Maginot Line is a defensive system in northern and eastern France, stretching from the Channel to the Mediterranean. It was built in the 1930s to hold off a German attack long enough for the French army to fully mobilize, and it is especially strong in the regions of Alsace and Lorraine. However, panzers broke through the line near Sedan in May 1940 during the invasion of France, leading to the encirclement of the Allied armies in the north and eventual French defeat. If this is all new to you, then watch our weekly episodes from May and June 1940, as well as the on-location special we did about the Maginot Line. Link in the description. In most places, the line does the job it's supposed to. In Alsace and Lorraine, it mostly holds off the German advance even when Paris falls and all hope of French victory is lost. But signing of an armistice, June 22, 1940, orders all French personnel on the line to surrender. The Germans take two million French prisoners of war, many of them from the line. What do they do with the fortresses? Well, German high command cannot deny their effectiveness. So when Alsace-Lorraine is annexed to Nazi Germany, they decide to use it for their own benefit. They start rebuilding damaged fortresses and restoring bunkers smashed during the Battle of France. But they don't really improve or alter things much. As the Allied bombing campaign of Germany gets going, the line becomes especially useful as a string of bomb-proof underground factories. They also draw up an order of battle for how the Maginot Line is to be defended. In 1941, Joseph Goebbels uses it for propaganda purposes, filming a documentary on the French campaign. Of course, with the defeat of France, it doesn't seem like the line will come in handy at any point, so heavy equipment and the guns are transferred west to the coastal Atlantic Wall as the war drags on, leaving the Maginot Line more and more vulnerable. But if any attack from the West does come, the Germans have the Maginot Line, should they need it. As I said, we actually visited the Maginot Line in France and did an on-location special on the fortresses last year. You can check that out right here. And if you're sitting out there with a World War II question that you are dying to ask me, post it on our Time Ghost website, community.timeghost.tv. It is thanks to the incredible support of our Time Ghost Army members that I can continue answering all your questions here in the Chair of Infinite Knowledge. So make sure to sign up, timeghost.tv or patreon.com. Subscribe, ring the bell. See you next time.